I know that um, some of you really like Platt's poetry, and she is a poet who is popular in the sense of when she comes up in the exam, a lot of students like to answer on her. But also she's quite popular with the examiner because she has been examined many times over the years. There's quite a number of poets who might have been set for study but not come up in the exam. But Platt, she has been set for study many on many occasions and she has come up numerous times, most recently 2019. Now, so I'm just going to briefly give you an overview of some of the important aspects of her work. And I hopefully to keep this video very short, 20 minutes. I'm going to just examine some of the key quotes from five of the poems. Um, and through those quotes, hopefully explore some of the thematic concerns that um, she addresses in her poetry. And also, of course, her style of writing. Because don't forget, like, if you're a geek like me and you like poetry, then, you know, reading Sylvia Platt's poetry is worthwhile in its own right. But if you're somebody who maybe is just looking at this as preparation for the leave insert, you got to have your game face on. you got to be, you know, practical and you got to make sure that you understand that if, you know, you're preparing a poet, then you're going to be asked to discuss not just what the poet says, but how the poet says it. Theme and language. Content and style. Okay? So what we know about Platt, Platt's a confessional poet. So she's a poet who, you know, writes very deeply personal poems. She's a poet who, you know, made that decision famously to write poetry that she described as being grim and anti-poetic. And what did that mean? Well, it meant that, you know, she was going to, you know, address the unpleasant realities of her life and that, that you know, she wasn't going to try and create poetry that might be beautiful, but that was real and raw. And I, I think Morning Song um, proves that she was actually capable of creating poetry of great beauty while writing poems that were quite raw. So as a little recap for those of you who are studying Platt about Morning Song. So obviously it's, a, it's one of her mother poems. The other one on the course is called Child. It's about the birth of her daughter Frida. And it's really, you know, it's a poem about happiness. People who think about Platt think about this, you know, because of the nature of the way her life ended and because of her, you know, history of um, struggles with her mental health, there's this image of Platt as being this kind of really dark and miserable person. And she absolutely wasn't. I mean, that, that, that doesn't sum her up. She was a, 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 like a vivacious, you know, talented, hungry, ambitious, driven, lively, intelligent young woman. And she did have happiness in her life. And this poem is a, is a, is a poem which celebrates, you know, the happiness that she felt when her daughter Frida was born. And it's about that connection between a parent and a child. And therefore, it's relatable because you might not be parents, but you are the children of parents and you have a connection. But it's also about that idea that, you know, things move on and we all age. There are certain things to look out for in Platt's poetry. These are called motifs. A motif, M-O-T-I-F, is really, you know, it's one of those English words, one of those words that English teachers use, I often think, to try and sound more intelligent than they actually are, or to justify their own existence, or to make themselves, you know, you know feel superior. Is that a terrible thing to say? I'll get in trouble, don't I? Um, but anyway, look, a motif is, in a simple way, it's a it's um, an aspect of style which is um, repeated and it might um, hallmark or or or, um, or identify the poet's work. And it can be it can be in, in terms of the thematic content. A motif can be you know repeated um, thematic concerns. In this case, I'm talking about um, imagery or style of writing. Platt uses light and darkness imagery throughout her poetry. Her use of um, metaphor and symbolism is often quirky and unusual. Um, she is a much like, as we discussed in previous commentaries on other poets, like Heaney, Boland, Durkin, Frost, uh, Bishop. She's a poet who you know, takes a narrative approach often and creates these dramatic scenarios where we have characters and settings and um, um, she explores her themes through this narrative style. And her work is introspective, inward looking and very, very, very honest. 
So let's have a look at the four, four of the really lovely quotes from um, Morning Song. Um, first of all, I just love the opening line. Love set you going like a fat gold watch. Love set you going like a fat gold watch. Beautiful meter. It's written in iambic pentameter. It's a gorgeous simile. Um, it's typical of her quirky style. It's unusual to think of a baby as like a watch. But it's the adjective noun combinations, fat gold watch, that really, you know, shows the, the substance and I suppose the depth and I suppose the, the real interesting um, um, qualities of, of this poet's work. So, okay, love sets you going. Simple. The child is the product of love. Platt was married to Ted Hughes. Platt loved Ted Hughes. Ted Hughes loved Platt. And the child, you know, is born out of that love. What a gorgeous thing to say. The simile... Calling the child fat is, is kind of capturing, it always makes me smile, um, you know, capturing that kind of little bit of baby uh, um, weight that, 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 that a child is born with. You know, it's kind of nature's insulation. It's very warm in the womb. The baby comes out of the womb. It's not as warm, so it has that little bit of puppy fat um, um, to keep it warm. Gold, you know, the association with something which is precious and valuable. You know, the child is, is appreciated and, and, and is valued by the parent. But also watch. I think that's really interesting because a watch measures time. Tick, 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 tick. And it's this awareness that, my God, you're a parent now. You know, you're a grown up. You're an adult. I love. You know, and that's just the first line. This is the, this is the thing about Platt. So think about so many of these poets that you really can, you know, look at a line. And, and there's so much going on. The language is so simple. If you look at that. Line one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine words. Only one of them has two syllables. That's going. The language is incredibly simple in terms of being monosyllabic, but it's actually very complex in terms of having, you know, a number of different ideas going on. Love that line. Then we get the much more complicated metaphor, okay? So this is really, I, I find this very interesting, but it is difficult. She says, I'm no more your mother than the cloud which distills a mirror to reflect its own slow effacement at the wind's hand. Now, it's tricky, isn't it? So the cloud is the key image, okay? The cloud. Now the mirror is, well, she's talking about mirror there, so there's a motif because she wrote a poem called Mirror, so we have that connection. But the mirror there, that's a puddle. So we have nature imagery. Platt employs nature imagery a lot in her work. But if you just can take for a moment in your imagination, um, the, the, the time to, to, to picture the image that she's describing. So we have a cloud, a rain cloud, and the rain cloud bursts and the water falls down from the rain cloud. And what does it form? It forms the puddle. Okay, so the cloud creates the puddle. The puddle cannot exist without the cloud. So the puddle or the mirror, that's the child, the rain cloud, that's the mother. Okay, so there's an innate connection between the two. You can't have one without the other. But also there's distance between them. The rain clouds up in the sky, the puddles on the ground. So while they are connected, there's also this sense of separation. And this captures Platt's kind of muted sense of um, um, connection to the child. Like she loves the child, loves that you go like a fat girl watch. She loves the child, but she doesn't feel any particularly special connection with the child. It's, it's her child, she loves the child, it comes from her, but it's just part of the natural world. So that's very interesting, very honest. You wouldn't, like, you know, one of the things I like about this poem is that she's talking about, you know, where she loves her child, but she doesn't feel a special connection. I would imagine a lot of mothers feel like that at the start, but people don't write that down because that's, you know, not what mothers are, for want of a better term, supposed to feel culturally, socially. Mothers are, young women are put under this, or women are put under this pressure, like they're going to have this amazing connection with their child at the start. And she said, well, no, I do have a connection, but it's not as... It's not as profound as maybe it might be. So I think that's a brilliant, interesting observation, not just about her experience, but also about, you know, motherhood in general or parenthood. Let's uh, broaden it in general. And again, great use of nature imagery, metaphor, symbolism. As I, I mentioned the, um, the use of, of um, light and darkness imagery. You see it throughout Platt's poetry. I love the image of dull stars in this poem. And look, you can say I'm, I'm, I'm over um, analyzing this. I, I really don't think I am. We have darkness, it's dark outside, but there is light. So 
Darkness, that's Platt's life. The child brings in light into her life. So the star is the child. The child brings in light into her, her otherwise dark existence. But the light that the child brings is dull. In other words, the happiness that the, being a mother brings her is definitely there. It's something which is tangible, like starlight. But it's also something which doesn't lift the darkness completely, like the rising of the sun in the morning. Okay? So she's capturing that idea of her struggle, I suppose, with the darkness and how she appreciates the child. She loves the child. She's happy to be a mother. But this is not going to transform her experience of life. I think very interesting, very honest. And speaking of which, the um, the physical description, the, the pen portrait that she uh, presents us of herself, you know, the unflattering description of herself, I suppose captures again that honesty, but also that maybe sense of self-deprecation. I don't know if you know that word, uh, where you kind of criticize yourself. One cry and I stumble from bed, cow heavy and floral in my Victorian nightgown. Like she's she's almost taking a distant, she's looking at herself from the third person perspective and she's kind of laughing at herself. She's talking about the fact that her body is prepared, you know, to feed the baby. So she feels like a big cow, like with the milk to feed the baby. It doesn't feel, feel right. She feels, you know, she's lacking uh, elegance or she's lacking... Um, um, she doesn't like the way she looks and she's wearing this big bloody Victorian nightgown because they had to wear these things in the hospitals in the 60s, women did. Um, and she's floral and she just fe feels unnatural to her um, being in that position. But the child cries and she's up. She stumbles from bed and there you have that connection that the parent has with the child beautifully captured. That's morning song, key images. We know that child is also poem about motherhood. This time written after the birth of Nicholas, her son. Uh, it's a poem, this is a poem about love, but it's also a poem about loneliness and despair. You know, uh, again, we have a dramatic scenario. Again, we have the quirky, unusual imagery and symbolism. Again, it's autobiographical. Again, there's light imagery. So connections between these, these two poems. These, these are two good poems to do together if you're preparing Platt. I absolutely love this poem. There's three quotes that I would say, look, these are the, these are the, this is the money here in this. I actually, I, I know the reason that that was number four, I noticed our student pointed out to me that I inadvertently got a bishop quote in this document um, when I posted it up on Moodle. So apologies for that, but I've since taken it out. It was because I was using the bishop document as a template for, for this one. Okay, she loves her child. Your clear eye is the one absolutely beautiful thing. Look at that for a declaration of love. Look at that for honesty. Look at that for personal writing. Look at the directness of the language. Again, your clear eye is the one absolutely beautiful thing. I love that um, the certainty and the uh, um, honesty and the directness of that line. The next image, which I really do adore. I want to fill it with colour and ducks, the zoo of the new. You know, I don't know if you have to be a parent to understand that image, but I know that I read that image before I became a parent and it didn't mean as much to me then as it does now that I am a parent. Just look at the imagery. Colour and ducks, you know. You bring your kid down to see the ducks. I mean, we were down at the near the river near where we live recently and it's springtime and there was that mother duck and about 12 little ducklings and I have a six-year-old and she nearly died looking at this. She thought it was amazing, beautiful. You want to bring your children into a happy world. You want your children to be happy. That's what the colour and ducks represents. I love the zoo of the new image. It's just it's such a simple clever the rhyming you know makes it playful but it captures what a parent wants for their child the zoo of the new when a child is growing up they have all of this new this the world is full of newness everything they experience they experience for the first time it's an exciting exhilarating place and that's what she wants for her child she wants her child to live a happy life a life full of experiences a, lo a life full of, of of the exhilaration like going to the zoo and seeing all the new animals and all that the world has to offer that's an expression in, in the most simple language. And again, if you look at the, 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 the pair of lines, you've got 
1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 words, one word of two syllables. All of the other words are all monosyllabic. The language is simple, the language is easy to understand, the language is straightforward, but the language is powerful and honest. And of course, the really famous thing about this poem is the juxtaposition between these images of happiness and, you know, celebration in the first stanza and the terrible, um, powerful depiction of her mental state in the second stanza when she contrasts what she wants for her son with what she has in her life and she describes her life as this troublous wringing of hands, this dark ceiling without a star. Now I mentioned motifs, there's the star reference. In the previous poem there was a dull star, so there was happiness, her life was dark but there was happiness. Now there's no star, you can't even see the sky. So there's a great example of light and darkness imagery being used by Platt to explore her mental psychological state at that time. And of course, to um, capture her whole experience in this image of the wringing of hands, the wringing of hands, the agitation of hands, something that we see again in other poems, for example, Black Rook and Rainy Weather, this image of agitation, of repeated behavior, trying to comfort herself, that's her experience of life. Now, the fact that she's able to take one, you know, easy to visualize symbol, of the troublous wringing of hands, the, the um, compulsive uh, um, tightening and movement of the hands to capture her anxiety, to capture the reality of her life. That's the power of Platt's poetry. It is honest, it is powerful, it is compelling, but it's also beautifully written because the language is so precise, so inventive and so um, easy to understand. Child is a fantastic poem. Do Child and Morning Song together. Third poem I like on the course, I really like, is Mirror. Again, I think it ties in well with the other two. Um, it's an interesting poem about the... Um, we, see, we see her in, in, in Child writing the kind of grim and anti-poetic poetry that she, she said she wants to write. This poem is about the impact of, 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 of looking inside yourself all the time. It's about introspection. You know, if we spend our whole time looking in and looking at and analysing ourselves and looking at our strengths and our weakness and focusing in on our struggles, well, you know, is that damaging? Well, this poem suggests it is. The poem, again, contains quirky, unusual images, the metaphor of the of the, um, the mirror, of the, of the lake, the narcissus, you know, um, classical allusion in the poem. Very, very interesting. Um, again, we have juxtaposition, the contrast between the opening stanza and the second stanza, and the same thing as in Child. Again, we have light and darkness imagery in this poem. There's loads and loads of things going on in this poem. But for me, Mirror is about the exp her experience of being a writer. Okay? And this idea that she's kind of compelled to write this type of poetry, that maybe, it's like, you know, using social media, that you know it's not good for you, but you feel compelled to, to use it. I don't use social media, so I don't know. But look, look at the speaker. She personifies the mirror in the first stanza. And the mirror, you know, if you look in the mirror, you're looking at yourself. And that's what she does when she writes her poetry. So have no doubt whatsoever that that mirror is a metaphor that represents her art, her poetry. I am not cruel, only truthful, the eye of a little God. What is God? God is powerful. God can compel you to do things. When the mirror says, I am not cruel, the implication is that the mirror might not be intentionally cruel, but by being truthful, it hurts. What's Platt saying? When she looks at herself with the kind of forensic detailed eye that she applies to her poetry it hurts she doesn't like what she sees just like when you look in the mirror and you're not looking your best so why does she write this type of poetry then when she explains in the second quote which i think is a magnificent quote which is like her really honestly saying this is why i write poetry 
The voice changes from the mirror to the lake. Now I am a lake. A woman bends over me, searching my reaches for what she really is. That's why she writes poetry. She's looking into herself because she wants to understand herself. She, in very um, reminiscent of, of, of Bishop's style of writing, she says a woman, the way Bishop talks about the child in, in, in Cestina or about the prodigal in that poem, where she kind of takes the third person approach to talking about herself because that creates this emotional distance which allows her to write about herself. But here she is looking in the lake and this reference to Narcissus, this reference to Narcissus who became so obsessed with himself and fell so in love with himself that it led him to his own destruction. There's no doubt whatsoever that that classical illusion dominates the second half of the poem. And when she, when she describes the woman looking into the lake, in the line, she rewards me with tears and agitation of hands. This is powerful writing. And again, it's a motif, M-O-T-I-F, a connection between... What, has, what we've seen in Child, with the troublous wringing of hands, what we will see in Black Rook and rain, Rainy Weather in a moment, we have the agitation of hands. So this, this process, this, look, this inward looking process, this examination of self, this compulsive art form that she has, you know, that she made the decision to make her life's work, it doesn't make her happy, it makes her unhappy. And that is powerfully driven home when she describes in the final part of the second and final stanza of the poem how she feels she's wasted her life doing this. In me she has drowned a young girl. What a shocking image. And in me an old woman rises toward her. There's a sense that the poet feels she's wasted her life, wasted her youth writing this kind of poetry. And then this really quirky, really unusual, weird, yet powerfully memorable simile Rises toward me day rises toward her day after day like a terrible fish. Whatever you think about that image, it's certainly startling. If you can imagine you now looking, peering down into a body of water, and suddenly this terrible fish bursts through the water at you. It's a moment of of shock, a moment of horror, a moment when you recoil. And this is you know, again, I think many in many ways, like Bishop, it's a moment of epiphany for the poet. That's why she's horrified when she writes this poem. Epiphany, P, sorry, E P I P H A N Y, E P I P H A N Y. Epiphany, understanding, insight. She's wasted her life. She's wasted her youth, and all it's made her is unhappy. Very personal, very honest, confessional, powerful, brilliantly written poetry. Black Rook and Rainy Weather is a poem that I know a lot of you don't like. I love it. Again, you've got nature imagery. You've got the fish in the previous poem. You've got the, um, the zoo of the new in Child. You've got uh, um, the... Um, sorry now. The... Uh, bu -bu 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 the the cloud and puddle image in, in um um morning song very very clever in black rook and rainy weather you've got the rook now a rook is a crow and the crow is a symbol for the poet the, when you look at the crow the crow represents how she sees herself and when we think about crows we think about the beautiful you know variety of bird life there is out there you don't think of the crow do you the crow's, you know, croak is unpleasant. It's got this big, you know, you know, vicious looking beak. It's not colourful. You know, it's 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 carnivorous. I suppose nearly all birds are. Sorry, stupid thing to say, I suppose. But we think, you know, crows, they're not pleasant. So when she looks at herself, she sees the crow. Now, this poem is in many ways about being a writer. Okay, but it's also about this idea of being a deeply unhappy person. And it's about, you know... You know, having hope and realizing that hope is not necessarily something that's going to change your life. I'll go through it really quickly. The key images. I know you've many of you have read this stuff already. We got the troublous ringing of hands. We've got the in child. We've got the agitation of hands and mirror. Now 
She looks up. On the stiff twig up there sits a wet black rook, arranging and rearranging its feathers in the rain. That's the poet. Pathetic fallacy is used. The rain representing her mood of melancholy, of sadness. The agitation of the bird, arranging and rearranging his feathers, mirroring her own agitation in her own happiness. Trying to keep herself sane, trying to keep herself in control, just like the bird tries to keep itself dry by moving its feathers constantly. Brilliant image. The next one, I do not expect a miracle. And there's an ellipsis there, that ellipsis means... I've left a bit of the quote out. Don't forget, don't do that too often. A lot of you get into a habit of writing the first two lines of a quote, first two words of a quote, and then the last three words of a quote and think that'll do. That won't do. You have to show you've done the work. But here, this is a long quote, so it's okay. I do not expect a miracle nor seek any more in a desultory weather some design. What she's saying is so honest here. If you look at this poem as, as her um, talking about her process as a writer. She's talking about inspiration. She's talking about when the, you know, that moment comes, that eureka moment comes where, oh, I know what to write. She's saying she doesn't expect that because she's waiting so long. But also when she talks about the desultory weather, she's again, she's using pathetic fallacy. Desultory means miserable. The miserable weather, that's her life. That's her unhappiness. That's her melancholy. That's what she decided to write about, the reality of her life. And she in writing her poetry, was looking for some design. I think that's a direct reference to Robert Frost. Okay, Robert Frost wrote that poem design about, you know, meaning, about the search for meaning in life. And she's saying, I, I don't look for meaning anymore. There may be moments of happiness. Again, we talked about light imagery in Platt's poetry and that motif. Look at a certain minor light. Does that not remind you of the, the, um, the dull stars? Where is it now? Yeah, the dull stars in morning song. Minor light, that's a moment of happiness. A certain minor light may still be incandescent out of a kitchen table or chair. What, what the hell does that mean? It's a brilliant example of dramatization. She's in her kitchen. She's looking around the place. She knows that the, 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 the clouds may move. There might be some sun might come in the window and might, you know, light up a chair. But it's still a chair. And the sun will move and the darkness will arrive again. And the chair, the table, the chair, the ordinariness of that image, the banality of that image represents her. Her life may be lit up by happiness, but ultimately the happiness will go away and she's still going to be left being the unimpressive person that she thinks she is. Outstanding. Her life, she says, in a brilliant metaphor, is a dull, ruinous landscape. It's the precision of the writing that, that always amazes me about the great poets. You know, you, know, you can read poets who, who, who are very, very complicated and very confusing, and I'm sure they're magnificent, and I'm sure people who are much more intelligent than I am can, can, can you know, parse their work and explain their work and why it's magnificent. But I love it when it's obvious. I think that's a skill. I think simplicity is underrated. And with Platt, you got just precision. You want to know what I feel about my life? It's a dull, ruinous landscape. Other images that are notable, again, images of light. The angel may choose to suddenly flare at my elbow, an image for inspiration. You know, the angel coming down, giving her this inspiration to write as a, met as a metaphor, symbol for, for artistic inspiration. This, this season of fatigue, brilliant example again of nature imagery, fatigue, exhaustion, tiredness, weariness, shouldn't use words that end with ness. But she's going to keep going. And what, what does she keep going for? She keeps going for the spasmodic tricks of radiance. And that, that's, that's the line in the poem. You know, I know there's seven quotes here. You're going, which ones did I learn, Paul? Whichever ones you want, dude. But I do love spasmodic tricks of radiance. Think about what spasmodic means. If you have a spasm, you have no power over it. You don't, you don't make it happen. It happens. Radiance is brightness. You have that light imagery again. But she's saying that brightness is a trick. Now, if brightness is a metaphor for happiness, and it has to be, it's traditionally seen light and darkness, light for happiness, darkness for um, 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 melancholy or sad or, or unhappiness. We have tricks of radiance. So what she's suggesting, she's suggesting that she's learned that happiness is a trick. Now, how can happiness be a trick? Well, because it doesn't last. 
It's spasmodic. It comes. You can't control how it comes or when it comes. You don't expect it to come, but it comes and then it quickly goes away and you're left in the darkness again. I, I absolutely love that stuff. I know, I, you know, Platt is not a poet that, you know, necessarily um, I've prepared with um, my full-time students this year because I've covered five poems, five poets. The three Irish poets, I think, are really important to do. I've done Frost as one of the you know, the greats that aren't Irish or female. I've covered Bishop, but Platt, for, I know a lot of you are covering Platt, and I think this will help. One last thing to look at, and I know you've probably done different poems, and don't forget it's about the selection of poems. Uh, the Arrival of the Bee Box is, I think, a fantastic poem, and I just want to uh, mark out three, or sorry, four lines from it. I love the fact that the box is used in the poem as a symbol for her. Um, the source of her unhappiness and her anxiety. I love that. And I love the fact that she talks about how you lock, we lock away the reasons for our unhappiness often and we, we're afraid of confronting those reasons because we're afraid of what, what they will, what confronting them will do to us, how painful it will be. And I think she captures that there. So that's personal and universal and relatable. But my favourite bits in this poem, there's three of them, Again, the language, symbolic, but simple, you know, monosyllabic. She, she talks about her anxiety as like a Roman mob. Isn't that magnificent? It's a simile. It's a classical allusion. If you don't know what the Roman mob is, you can't understand the image. You have to go and look out. Look out. I mean, I don't think that, you know, writing is bad writing if, you, if it forces you to go off and have an you know, inquisitive mind and find out what the reference is. The Roman mob was you know, a symbol for violence and uh, danger and, uh, you know, and um, irrational um, um, chaos. So this is how she feels about her anxieties. She feels if she starts unlocking that box and letting one out, they'll all come out like the bees and she'll be overwhelmed and it will destroy her, like the mob will destroy her because she's not strong enough to cope. And how does she communicate that? sense that she's not strong enough she does it in this most simple and brilliant and accurate and precise language i am not a caesar classical illusion who's caesar don't forget he was not an emperor he's a strong man he's a symbol of power the german word kaiser comes from his name. The Romans took his name and used it to mean emperor. The, the, the Russians, the word Tsar comes from Caesar. Power. What's she saying? I am not a Caesar. I'm too weak. Finally, the lovely um, gustatory image when she says, I am no source of honey. Brilliant. Nature imagery again, capturing the honesty of her work, the the the, the powerful, um, moving off and moving, um, profound insights into her life you find in her work. Honey is sweet. She says, there's nothing sweet about me. I think there was. She was a magnificent writer. Hopefully that helped. Sorry, I have a visitor.